Hi there, welcome everyone. This is Inside the Musician's Mind, the first time we're doing a uh, all a digital Zoom episode of the show. Normally, we would be doing this in our Lapham room over at the library, at uh, the Port Washington Public Library. But I decided that uh, since we've got an opportunity to talk to uh, a very fine songwriter, recording artist, and an old friend, uh, we bring it to the digital age here, go fully uh, Zoom, uh, the, the Zoom realm for our episode of Inside the Musician's Mind. And I am, let's start that again. And I am proud to welcome to the show, my friend, John Babcock. Hey, John. How hey. are you? All right, Tony. How you doing, man? Good. It's been a long, long time. We, um, the last time we did a show together was going back to 1986. 85, 85, 85 and 86. We did two yeah, shows. The two yeah. shows. And so yeah. it's uh, it's been a lot of years. And uh, I'm so delighted to be catching up to you and with you because there's been some great music. And uh, I'm happy to have been starting to play catch up with the, the most recent projects. And yeah. yeah. Start making my way, making my way back, of course. Um, yeah. So you are going to be joining us at the library. Uh, yeah as of yeah. this recording, we're, we're recording this on uh, June 2nd, and uh, you will be with us on the, the I'm trying to remember, the, the 15th. 16th, 16th, I believe it's Ju June 16th. Yeah. June 16th for one of our oh. terrorist events. And you're gonna be doing a, a live version of what is your most recent recorded project, uh, which is very cool. And you've approached it from a very cool angle. Um, the live set is called Paul is All. Right. And the name of the album? It's just uh, Paul is All Tribute Album. Okay. Uh, the website uh, that I, uh, my newest website for this project and for this show that I do is paulisalltribute.com. Great. So that's uh, where people can see like what I'm doing with the show as a solo performance. And I have a trio and a quartet. So it's an expandable um, show that can be booked for any event. But it can be done in three different formats. Yeah, but yeah. still me doing Paul, you know. Yeah. Now on the on the album, uh, as is the case, I'm, I know in a lot of projects that you work with, it's all you. I mean, it's you doing. Yeah. All yeah. I had I had uh, a, a, a friend of mine play some lead guitar on it and some keyboards. His name is Leo Rojo. Leo's originally from Venezuela, and uh, I played with him uh, at Epcot for many years in the British Invasion when I was doing the. Uh, doing Paul McCartney with the, with the British Invasion at, at Disney's Epcot. Cool. So uh, we still work together um, along with another uh, member from those days, Jimmy Pappas. And Jimmy used to be Chubby Checker's drummer back in, in the, uh, before the British Invasion days. Uh, and we worked together from 97 to, 2000, uh, to 2008. And uh, these days we still, um, he, those guys are backing me up in this trio and quartet version of the, uh, Paul's all shot. Yeah. Cool. So it's old, yeah. old friends, people you work together on and off for years. Yeah. Great. You know, I've been, I've been working with them for over 25 years, you know, uh, down here in Florida. Um, but going back to what you said about this, this the uh, Paul's all tribute album that I'm just releasing, I chose six, six McCartney solo things that he did, you know, on his own and with wings and then six Beatle tracks. And so it's a 12 track album. I played pretty much everything except for what Leo played on and um, all the drums, all the bass and stuff. And I got a home studio and um, the vocals. And uh, it's what happened. You know, I never said I was really going to do a tribute album to the Beatles or to Paul McCartney, but it came out of necessity, really, because um, I do these shows. I've been, I started doing the McCartney show, seriously doing it him as a solo artist in 2017, 2018. And we did some big shows down in Florida and people would come out uh, when I do the meet and greet and, uh, and I merchandise out there, my own original stuff. And people would like be interested, oh, you do your own stuff and they'd buy some CDs and I've got a DVD they'd buy. But uh, my wife who does my merchandising for me and all that would say to me, her name is Elena, you'll meet her later. She says, uh, you know, the people, maybe someday you might think about doing like a, you know, something that's got connected with the show, like an audio of the, uh, kind of represents a show. Cause they're asking, well, does he have this, him doing the Beatles songs or the Paul McCartney songs uh, right. from the show? And, she, right. and she'd have to tell him no. So I said, all right, 
you know, maybe I should go in and, and do this. Start. So they can have kind of like a keepsake, you know, if they want me to sign it, I can take pictures with them. And then they've got something to play for somebody and say, this is the guy I saw. This is what he did. You know, absolutely. So, yeah. So that's yeah. for that reason. But I find this, you know, me, uh, this music, the Beatles music and McCartney stuff is so is sacred to me. I don't, not, nobody can do it better than them. And so it's like, uh, I, that's why I never attempted, but then for this reason, for the show, I figured, okay, I, it could be a soundtrack to the show. That's all. Sure. Sure. That's like why the, I've done it. The tail was wagging the dog a little bit on that one, but the end result was still very, yeah. very cool. And it was yeah. fun to do. I said, oh, and I was like, okay, all of this stuff. See, the whole thing is I'm basing the show off of his 40 year live thing that he's did starting with Wings up to present day. You know, so it's, you know, I, I was very, very lucky to get to see him when I was very young. I was 17. I saw him at the Garden in 76 Wings Over America. Yeah. And which was amazing. You know, I mean, yeah. I was I, I had a scout tickets. So I think the ticket, my ticket was sixty dollars, which was like a fortune. And wow. Seven. Back then. Yeah. That's that's but I had like wow. first row behind behind the stage. I was behind him, but he was like right there, you know. That's and cool. so I, mean, I was shaking for three days, man. You know, <laughs> I, mean, I was like, what was that? You know, I mean, just to see a beetle was amazing. But to see him, you know, it was incredible. Yeah. Yeah. So. You know, so the show is based off of from like 74, 75 wings over Europe and then the U.S. tour and then right through all the decades. So I had a, I had all this stuff to pick from. I was like, OK, what am I going to do? I said, well, I'm just going to do something that I really feel I can do it justice where I could sing. You know, I could try to emulate him. You know, yeah. I'm very fortunate. Yeah. People tell me I sound like him. I look like him and all that. Yeah, but it's it's you know it's easier said than done. I mean, you got to go in and really do it. Because I said, okay, once I put this out, you know, I, I better be okay with it because you know, <laughs> I get a Again, with this. Once, once you do it, it's done. You know? Perpetuity, so, perpetuity, man. Yeah. That's what stays out there. Yeah. You know? So I, I I came I, you know, really thought about it and I and I picked out and I said, well, I got to do half and half because that's kind of what he does now. Right. You know, he does, he, you know, he does, he favors more of the Beatles songs, but I didn't want to do just the Beatles songs or just the solo ones. So I did a, a, a I kind of did a mixture of all just to kind of get an idea of the 35 songs that I do yeah. in the show. And the other thing, too, is that, you know, he's 78 now, right? He's soon to be 79. Mind blowing. Um, so he's got a few years on me. So I'm kind of doing the way visually I do it as I do him in 2004, 2005, when he's the same age then, you know, that I am now. And what's so, great is that, you know, you, <laughs> you've, pull, you've pulled some of the, some of the live versions have that vibe of that 2003 tour of right. that feel. Right. And, and to me, you, you married those, those ideas really, really, really well oh, thanks. Um, on the record. Thank and, in fact, why don't we go to one of the tracks from uh, from the the you know from the album from the, the upcoming album, and uh, uh, what was it that we were going to play? We were going to play coming up. Oh right? yeah, one of my faves. So and John again, Lennon's fave too. What's that? John That's Lennon's right. fave too. If you That's remember, right. he said, "Yeah, he says I like the freaky version." But of course, I did the live version, the Glasgow kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> but still, though, again, you know. Well, we'll we'll let everybody hear a bit of it. So here we go. This is coming up. This is uh, John Babcock. This is from uh, the upcoming album. Paul is all a tribute. Is that the full title? So people know how to look for it. They'll find it. They'll find it. John Babcock. Paul is all. Here we go.
And that is uh, our friend John Babcock and uh, the live version of uh, coming up from, uh, well, actually on the album, it's all John on that. And uh, we'll, again, uh, as of this recording, uh, June of 2021, uh, John will be at the library uh, doing that set. Paul is all. Keep an eye on the library website for all the exact information and make your uh, registration reservations. But, um, you know, you and I met many years back through the Beatles connection. I was doing a program yeah. called um, Beatle Tracks. And we, we knew one another and saw one another at the Beatles conventions and all that fine stuff. Back when it was actually called Beatle Fest, they didn't yeah. have to call it the Fest for Beatle fans. Um, but, um, you know, and I ask everyone this when we do an Inside the Musician's Mind, what, what got you into this? What, you know, how did, uh, the, you know, a, a three-year-old, a four-year-old, a five-year-old John Babcock say, music is it. This is what I want to do. First music that turned you on, first music that pulled you into wanting to create both. Well, to be honest with you, as far as the Beatles thing concerned, is seeing them on the Ed Sullivan show. I was, I had just turned five years old on January 30th. And of course, they were on February 9th. So almost 10 days later, uh, my, my, and also my father was a professional jazz drummer, Jackie Babcock. He was a professional jazz drummer. So he had me playing. Uh, drums already by the time I was about two or two and a half years old. Wow. Got a great photograph of him. He was also a police officer at the time too, in our, in our town of Nyack, um, in Nyack, New York. And so, but he played on the weekends and, uh, and he, I heard, I heard a lot of different types of music around the house, but as far as the Ed Sullivan show was concerned, I remember, you know, he said to me, because we watched the Ed Sullivan show anyway. That's what we did. You know, you watch the Jack and Lisa show and you watch the Honeymooners and all that stuff. And he said, hey, he said he knew about them being on there. Everybody knew. It. And, you know, would you, you know, hey, you can see a past your bedtime. He said, you got to see this group. They're, they're called the Beatles and they're from Liverpool, England. And he didn't really know about, he knew Ringo because he was the drummer. And being, my dad being a drummer, he remembered the guy's name was, you know, Ringo was Ringo. So there it was. I sat there in front of the old RCA black and white TV set in that winter of 60, 64. And uh, I remember my my mom and dad sitting there in the living room with me and they came on and Ed introduced them. And I, I just, it just something did it to me, you know, like even at five years old, I was like, I love music anyway, because I was hearing it from my dad. But then to see these guys and hear them and then the girls screaming and I was like, wow, now that's this is this is what I want to do here. This is, you know, and you didn't, you know, when you're five, you don't know what you want to do, but it, it affected me as it affected millions. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, it was just, it was an amazing thing. And um, so that's, long story short, that's really the, the juggernaut that set me off. That was the thing. Was Brilliant. seeing them on the Ed Sullivan show, was just, you know, I was floored by it. It's so cool that it was at such a young age because, you know, I mean, I just got through reading Liberty DeVito's book. We were just uh, speaking with um, Stephen Van Zandt and, you know, same thing. I mean, you know, one of my co-hosts of my show asked, you know, so a little, the first question he said to Stephen was, so Stephen, what did you do on February 9th, uh, February 10th, 1964? And Stephen said, I went out and started a band, you know, and yeah. that's it. He was yeah. old enough to do, but to be so young. And, and how did the, how did the songwriting start to come about? I mean, we met again, we go back to 1985 and uh, bring us into that. You, when did the songwriting start and what was that? What was that project, that very important project that, that you and I met? Over? Yeah, well, you know, the songwriting came along later on. I mean, I, I, I was, like I said, my dad was starting off on the drums. And by the time I was 10 or 11, I was, he got me into the drum and bugle course. So I was in the snare line, you know, I was in the Pearl River Cadets out of uh, Pearl River, New York. And then after I did that for a few years, I became, I was in like a DCI, one of the major contenders, which was the Hawthorne Muchachos out of Hawthorne, New Jersey. So I was in the snare line in that. And it was right around that time that it was like 76, 75, 76, 77, when I was in the drum corps, I was still writing and, and demoing up, you know, starting to write more songs and working on them at them, you know, at home. Sure. And, uh, but I didn't get, I didn't start to record professionally until 1978. And that's when I got a production deal. If you remember a guy named Bob Swade, we talked about Bob Swade. Mm -hmm. Bob's doing well. He still has a studio in Hackensack. Uh, it's called the Swade Interactive Center now. Cool. Uh, was Sway Productions, but that's where I got my first start. He was my first producer. And then I was writing a lot when I got the production deal. I started to really 
write a lot. And then that's of course the songs, you know, you want to be the, you want to write, you know, songs as good as the Motown stuff and the Beatles stuff and, you know, the Beach Boys. I mean, I love Brian Wilson and all that stuff. So I had all these influences and that stuff I've been listening to since a little kid, you know, it rubs off on you, man. You know, and I, you know, you know, your first couple of songs are kind of crap. They're not very good. <laughs> you know, I mean, you got to yep. start somewhere, right? But then you, you know, you hone it and like everybody that's ever done it, you work at it and you get a little, like, little you know, you get better at it. So yeah. and that leads us right into the eighties. So I started to really do some stuff. And then by the time 85 came around, when we did the first two, 85, 86, when we did the first uh, Beatle track shows, I had already gone to London with my brother, Rye. Yeah. And we recorded at Abbey Road. So if you go to Abbey Road, you better have your, your stuff together by then. So you bet. And that was the Out of the you Blue bet. album. That yes. was Out of the Blue. This yeah. is a great, great album. We, I was playing stuff from that on the radio show. Uh, yeah. And it was really yeah. nice that it, it fit in so well with those other guys. You know, as you say, when you're yeah. when you're trying to write yeah. songs and you're reaching for that level, that's what you go for. You go for the brass ring. You go for trying to do the Beatles, the Brian Wilson, the, the Motown. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the Motown stuff and all the great, all those great songs. I mean, so I was really, you know, influenced by the British Invasion stuff, you know, the Beatles and all the British Invasion stuff. And also go other side of the coin of all the Motown stuff and you know, so that, you know, that kind of trickles into your work as you get, as you go on. And that's, Absolutely. You know, to this day, I still, you know, it's not like a conscious draw. You don't say, well, I think I'm going to write, write a Motown song. To it's some, like you said, the song, No, No, No. I mean, that mm. is kind of a kind of, you know, Jackson 5, little groovy, you know. Absolutely. Thing to it. And that and, just and. comes from hearing top 40 radio of what it was at the time. Yeah. And it's funny because. You know, I, I always make notes and I heard the track. And the first thing I wrote was, you know, for myself, I wrote a laugh out loud. This is definitely the result of some different influences. Yeah. And uh, again, but, you know, you're you're also, um, you know, you're you're a songwriter who finds hooks, not just musically, but uh, lyrically. You know, no, no, no. You have a, and I'm not giving too much, but you have that a catch line that is you have always been this little mystery. And, you know. A very simple, a simple line, but it's yeah. a great hook. And the, the thing about hearing a track like that, and we'll hear that in a, in a moment, um, is that, you know, obviously now, you know, we can't be in all places at, at once. Some things are done on synthesizer, et cetera, but you hear those real horns, you know, it's a real horn solo in that. And uh, that's, that's wonderful. So yeah. uh, nothing like so, real horns. Yeah, nothing like real horns you know, at all. A, I mean, today they have the most amazing samples. Certainly better than we had back in the, in the seventies or the eighties. You know, when people were trying to sample stuff, stuff, and but you know, but it's nothing like. Yeah, you know, it's like the difference between celluloid, you know, film, real like thirty-five millimeter, sixteen millimeter film with a light going through it. You bet. You know, yeah. opposed to like a digital thing or or modeling, you know. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. So when you hear it, you can hear the, you know, that the breathy thing coming. That's through. what it is. You can yes, Larry time. Butts, by the way, I'm gonna put in. Remember, put in a plug. Yes. Larry yes. Butts. You know, he, played <laughs> on the he plays with the Blues Brothers. Well, he's he'll he'll start now that, uh, uh, you know, things are getting back to a little bit of normalcy. Uh, he's been at uh, for years playing with the Blues Brothers in Universal uh, in Orlando. Yeah. It's and so, it's I need a makes, sax guy, I call him Larry. And he makes a great sound. So let's hear a little bit Doesn't of no, he? no, no. And then we'll come back and we'll we're gonna we'll jump back to Abbey Road Studios after we how we do this. We're gonna play no no no. Then we're gonna play a little bit of our, our uh original appearance back in 85, and we'll talk oh. a bit more about Abbey Road. <laughs> Sounds <laughs> good. Yeah, you you, me, and my brother Rye. Zooch. <laughs> Zooch, right? <laughs> All right, here we go. This is from and this is from your, I should, we should get this in and we'll hear a little more from this, but this is from your last album of original music. Yes. Welcome to my world. world. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, obviously plans down the road for, I'm sure for another uh, original record, but uh, this is just a really fine album. So here's a little bit of no, no, no. Come on now, 
the boys from Abbey Road Studios. Abbey Road Studio number two, actually, the one that they've been using since the good old days of Love Me Do here on Beatle Tracks. That's the first part of the Abbey Road special. And this is Beatle Tracks, and JB is with us, and we're talking about Abbey Road Studios, appropriately yeah, enough, aren't we? which is where you just recorded. Yes, it was great. You, uh, you instigated some... Uh, <laughs> you, you, the two of you did some... He was worse than me. Uh, it, was like, it was like letting a, a Beatle maniac out in Pepperland. <laughs> we were everywhere. <laughs> Checking out... All nooks and crannies of the place. Checking out the layout. Yeah, find all kinds of goodies. Finding what lie under the floorboards at Abbey Road. <laughs> <laughs> just, just taking right. it all in. <laughs> but, um... Tell them about the... Okay, tell them about the lights. Okay, that's what we wanted to talk mm -hmm. about, right? The okay, lights. The I don't lights. mean to get off the sidetrack, but it's there's right. so many yeah. things to tell you folks yeah. out there. Well, wait, we're gonna, we're gonna get to the lights in just a moment. Ooh. But first... Suspense. I'm, oh, suspense. Keep them we're hanging. Gonna, yeah, you know, keep them hanging on, because uh, they're gonna stay right with us here at WCWP 88.1 FM and Beatle Tracks, the program, because here for another hour or so, bringing you the best and the rest of the music of the Beatles and talking with JB and Zooch and uh, listening to the music from the album Added to Blue, <laughs> which uh, was recorded at, partially at Abbey Road, partially at, uh, uh, at Suede Communications Center. It's like looking at baby photos. <laughs> <laughs> Stick to that. Very All right. Nice so, <laughs> 35, six years later, whatever it is, what was going on with the lights? The lights. <laughs> yeah, you know, it was amazing because, um, you know, we had we had a run in the studio over there. <laughs> you know, we were there for three days. And at that time, it was in April of 85, there wasn't really that many art other artists there. You know, it's like people who worked there and me, my brother, and, and Bob Swade, uh, my uh, co-producer at the time. And it was so strange. And my brother was looking at, you know, was checking different rooms out and all that. And I think it was... It was on like the second day we were there and he you know said hey i found these lights in uh, in one of the closets over there he said oh, it, it, you know and these lights and they're on like a stand i said let me see and i went and looked at it and i said i think i know what these are and he's and he, and he you know i said these i think these are the the lights that george harrison asked uh emi to bring in to get some atmosphere when they were working on sergeant pepper you bet. So I asked one of the engineers, and you know, we said, I said, hey, what's those lights down? There's two of them, and there was two of them on these stands. And uh, I said, are those, are those old lights from the 60s? He goes, oh, yeah, that's the one the Beatles used to use. I was like, oh, are you kidding me? And I said, I said, do they still work? He says, yeah, I think so. He said, they, he said, you can pull them out and set them up if you want. And so my brother was like, oh, my God, this is incredible. How could you not? So we pulled them out and plugged them in, and they were all dusty. We dusted them off, and we set them up in Studio Two, 
Wow. Uh, and we we were video. We brought a videotape and we had a you know we had an early you know 1985 86 uh, video camera. So we taped about five hours of stuff during. The, I never knew I was going to go back there. You know, seven times. You know, sure. between 85 and 95, I went back all these times. So we thought, well, this is it. You know, we had a one shot. Formula. Yeah, my brother. My brother was there to help me. You know, I was doing the music and all, and he was helping with uh, documenting everything. Okay. So we got. He had a nice Nikon 35 millimeter, took a lot of stills, and then we set the lights up. And so we actually got to use during the sessions the lights that George brought in. And um, that's it was amazing. They all worked, all that they were just those neon painted red bulbs that were on uh, on these stands. So that's the story of the lights. <laughs> like you said, letting <laughs> letting a Beatle maniac loose in Pepperland. That's a perfect that's exactly what it was. That's a blast. Well, I mean like you said you've been back there multiple times and yeah, recorded yeah. a bunch of of different things there um you know people talk about that room that studio as having an energy like nowhere and like nothing else um i imagine that it's not you know yes it's the fact that the beatles are your or your favorite band the beatles you know recorded there etc but there's got to be there's something else I guess that just that draws you back to that room and is it is it the energy the sound all of the above what what brings you back it's, to that as a it, you know it's really hard to put in words and I've been trying I've been thinking about you know that an answer to that question for since I first did it in '85 yeah you know, I, I know of other artists that work there um, and we, we all agree it does have a certain ambiance and a, 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 well first of all. The studio is amazing anyway. That's why they haven't changed any of the acoustics. The acoustics are exactly as they were in the 50s. Um, and, and there is, when you, there's such reverence for the, for, for the room because of all, not only just the Beatles stuff was done here, but all of the other artists. I mean, Glenn Miller recorded the last mm -hmm. recording that he did before he went down in the English Channel. That was done in, you know, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I don't remember what the song was, but the last couple of recordings that were released after he died were done at Studio Two at Abbey Road. You know, wow. Um, Sting recorded there. Everybody, uh, you know, Ella Fitzgerald did her version of "Can't Buy Me Love" there in '64. I mean, so that room uh, is just—it's got the the most hit records ever came out of it, uh, and most diversified uh, recording history. Yeah. So when you go there. And you're doing your own thing in there, you know something that you did. You know, you know, it, it, it's just it's, it's incredibly humbling, actually. <laughs> you know I, mean? I would imagine it really yeah. brings you down. It really levels you up and says, <laughs> you know, I might think this is a great song, but you got to remember who came before you. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that's yeah. big shoes for any artist to come in there and do, no matter how good you are and what you do. When you look at that, what that what was done in that room. Yeah, it humbles you up real quick. It, I, I mean, I'm sure it humbles you, but it also, I'm sure, again, back to that brass ring idea, man. If you're going to have a goal and have something to hit for and shoot for, it's that yeah. goal to to want to live up to the room, really. Yeah, yeah. Which, which it, must be a wonderful vibe. Yeah, it was. It, it was. It was just so amazing. Um, you know, and then I, you know, as, as you probably might remember me talking about on the old show was. That I got to use the, the, their actual microphones. Yeah. That was another amazing thing. Was and I requested that. You know, I there was about a dozen microphones that we used for vocal mics, for micing amps and the drums and Ringo's drums and all that. And they have them all marked and they had them in there. And it was uh, through one of the engineers that I requested it the first time I went over. Should I use one of the mics that that, that John George or, or or even Ringo could have used? And uh, they they gave me that 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 dream, the made that dream come true. And yeah. I used that on out of the blue. And every time I went back, I'd use something else that they used. So that was really cool. I'm sure, in a way, for the engineers that were there when you first went, and all the years, the following years when you went back, I'm sure for the engineers, it's beautiful to have. You know, the first time you went in, you were how old when you went into Abbey Road for the first time? Twenty six. Yeah, I was so twenty six. Yeah. Here you are. You're somebody in your twenties. You're, you know. Uh, you know, you're at work and at, and at the height of your, you know, not the height, I mean, you know, your creativity grows and changes as you go, but you're, you're at a, a mid twenties, you're eager. You're, it's your hot period, you know? Hot, yeah. yeah. Well, it's, you know, yeah, yeah you, know. you know what I mean? Your energy. You're hungry. Yeah. That's, 
that's really where I'm going. And yeah. these guys must appreciate that. And they must feel that too. So for them to be able to share that room with you, to share that energy with you, that's really cool on their end too, I'm sure. Yeah. You know, um, and you went back how many times for, for different records? Yeah, right? I did say 85, 86. My brother went on both of those occasions. And then I went back on my own. I'd miss you. 91, 93, no, 88, 91, 93, 95 was the last time I was there. And he thought about ever going back again? Oh, you're kidding in a second. Okay. <laughs> in a second. Maybe on the, maybe on the next John Babcock originals album. You never oh, know. <laughs> oh, man. I love it. You know? Uh, um, we talked a little bit about influences, and uh, b- before I play the title track to the last uh, the last studio album, I want to play a little bit of a, a ballad uh, called "Late Hours," and uh-huh. uh, yeah, just what a fine track and influence I'm hearing there. Uh, I'm hearing a lot a lot of Graham Nash in that. Really, that's um, nice. I like Graham. Yeah, and and there's definitely some Graham in there, and that again. Finding those lines, and uh, uh, it, it made me do one of those. And you hear it the first time, but line in the song: "I never met anyone like you before, except me." And again, great line, uh, great. Well, yeah, you know why? Because I had a great influence. I wrote that for my wife. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, when, can... we were, when we were dating, uh, that's exactly I said that to her, and she said, "Wow, that's you know." It's a very mean. And I didn't want to forget line. the line. There you go. It's like you know, it was like, it was like oh, that could be a song. I thought. You know. I mean, it was a me for heartfelt a sentiment. <laughs> heartfelt sentiment. Could you excuse me for a minute while I write this? Yeah, down? Hold on for a second. I got to go write this down. <laughs> now you don't forget. It was a very. It was a very great moment, and um, you know, uh, I, it's a beautiful song that I wrote, wrote about my the love of my life. So, Brilliant. Brilliant. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so well, Let's hear a little bit of, and, and uh, you know, it's uh, what I like about this, a love song that is spoken plainly. And it's one thing I equated to with, with, you know, with McCartney, who we were talking about, some of Paul's ballads, short, sweet, perfect. You know, he do something, he can do something in two and a half minutes and say something. And, you know, so let's hear, let's hear late hours from uh, Welcome to My World. I lift up my heart To show you things you may have never thought you'd see And you give back the light From the moon and stars I'm seeing in your eyes I never met anyone like you before Except me So when I come knocking on your door Let it be Cause I never met anyone like you before When we talk at late hours I can hear your heartbeat on the other side Like a beautiful flower I can see you open gently in the night I never met anyone like you And if you find you need me more, let it be Cause I never met anyone like you before I never met anyone like you before 
one of the songs on there is a song called Masterpiece. Now, I didn't write that one, it, it, but it's it was written by a woman named Leslie Pearl. Now, okay. she sang background vocals on one of my first sessions, on two songs on one of my first sessions back in 79. Wow. And uh, she's the one that wrote the Folgers commercial. The best part of waking up is Folgers in your cup. Oh, goodness. She was one of the most in-demand, and still is one of the most in-demand um, jingle singers in New York City. Wow. Her, her sister, Debbie, is a, is a film producer, uh, and she just did a couple of years, like two years ago, three years ago, she did a film with Ed Asner out in Hollywood. And I found Leslie, I've been, I haven't talked, 2018, I got in touch with her through Debbie, through Facebook. Because oh, Leslie didn't have, wasn't on there. So, but Debbie was. I said, you, are you Leslie Pearl's sister, Debbie? And she said, yes. I said, I'm trying to get in touch with her. I want to record one of her songs. And I want to say hello. She, she worked on my first album in 79. And so she gave me her email address. And, and then I gave Leslie my, my number uh, here in Florida. And she called me. And we hadn't talked to each other since 1979. This is, this is almost 40 years. Wow. And she's doing well. She's in her early 70s, I believe. And she's still doing things. She lives in New York, Manhattan. She's a Manhattanite, you know? Yep. And uh, I yep. said to her, hey, I got this song. You gave me this cassette tape back in 79 of songs you were recording at Bob Swade Studio. See, she was doing some demos there of songs. And she's very, very, um, how can I say? She's kind of, she's, I mean, she's right in there with Carol King. I mean, that's singing wise, writing wise. She is, and I love Carol King. And I'm telling you, she's right on par with Carol King. Wow. She just, and she had an album out uh, in the um, in the 80s. She did one solo album and uh, she did she did pretty well with it, but she they wanted her to go on tour and she didn't want to tour and she was doing great as a jingle writer. She didn't have to. So she, they let her out of the contract and that was it. But um, yeah, so this song yeah. on there, uh, Masterpiece is, um, yeah, it's cool that she, uh, and I got her to, I used her voice I sampled her voice to sing one line in the chorus parts. Oh, that's blessing. cool. She said, yeah. Yeah. You know, I said, I got the demo, which is you singing the piano. Can I use, I did basically what they did with For Years of Bird. Yep. Yeah. And cool she was familiar everything. with that. I cleaned it up and I said, I'm going to record the song. I'm going to sing it, play all the instruments on it. And I'm going to use you and your piano for just the end of each chorus. Do you mind? She said, no, I don't even remember the song, she said. <laughs> you know? so, yeah, so you got to hear that. It's really cool, too. Oh, yeah. that's great. That's great. Yeah. That's a great story, yeah. too. You you and Leslie still in touch? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's great. Yeah. Great. yeah, yeah, yeah. Matter of fact, she, uh, you know, I sent her, before I released the album, I sent her to her, I said, if you don't like it, let me know, let me know you know, before I release it. She, <laughs> she said, oh, and she said, oh, John, I love what you did with it. You know, you sound great. And, you know, thanks for, you know, wanting to do it, you know, and I said, and she, and she said, if I can get this, if I can get this in a commercial, I will. There you, you know? go. That's so, a that's beautiful still, thing. That's still, you know, that still could, could happen. You know, it's been a couple of years, but you know. Yeah, that's a beautiful you know? thing. Yeah. And matter of fact, she's going to be on, she's again, appearing on my next album because, nice. um, I re-recorded a song called Love Hurts that I did. That's one of the ones she sang the background vocals on. Okay. And I had, I want, I said, you know what? I want to go and re-sing this now. And I had, I had the track with the background vocals and her and all the instruments, like an instrumental version of it that I mixed at the time. Okay. I cleaned, I cleaned it up and I re-sang to, to it now. Like with uh, now, last year during the yeah. lockdown. Yeah. So oh, it's it's me at twenty years old playing the instruments and singing the background vocals with her, but it's me now, forty years later singing it, and I was like, I I, I was able to do it in the same key. That's cool. Really, yeah, I was like, that's cool. I wonder if I'm going to have to lower this thing and then bring it back up, and that's <laughs> I'll start singing like a chipmunk. <laughs> but I was, oh, that's I was fun. Free. Yeah, it was fun to do, and, and it came out really good. So she's going to appear on the next album called Sky's the Limit. That's the name, the name of the new album. Nice, nice. It's 20 tracks, and it's got some live stuff on it. It's pretty cool. And well, a bunch of new songs. Well, you've also set me up now. We'll, uh, we'll come back, and uh, I just want to I'll talk to you a little bit about, uh, um, I guess, the, the method, uh, and then maybe we'll um, 
you know, okay. we'll talk a little bit more about the Paul is all project, but um, uh, let's listen to the title song from the most recent studio album. I mean, very sweet, very sweet song. And uh, I like that there's, you know, talk about the Paul influence, a little Georgish guitar solo, some beach boys backing vocals in there. Yeah, yeah. And uh, again, uh, a great, a great vibe, which is, uh, and, and positive. Uh, I like the fact that, um, a lot of the music that you write is very positive and that's uh that's very cool so uh let's hear some of welcome to my world this is the title song from the most recent studio album but uh again another one we've just found out is going to be on the way so here we go So that is the title song from uh, Welcome to My World, the most recent studio album. I know the one, as you're saying, in the works. Aside from the fact that obviously you've got a, a wonderful, uh, happy marriage and a happy life going on, what are the muses? Where, where, did, where do the songs come from for you? What, what gets to you first, music lyrics? And what do you pull from? Where does it all come from? You know, it, it, it's, it's never been, I'm not the type of artist or writer, you know, to just dream up songs or, you know, constantly writing down lyrics or all oh, that would be a great idea for a song. It doesn't work that way. For me, it's about sitting down at, with an instrument. Okay. Know? Yeah. And I've heard McCarty actually talk about this because they asked him the same thing. They asked him, well, how do you get these songs? And he goes, I don't know. It just comes to you, you know. It's a gift, you know, and I, I couldn't agree more. That's mm. ever since I started writing when I was like 15 years old. Um, yeah, you get influenced by maybe, you know, relationships and, and maybe current events or things like that. But for me, it's like picking up the guitar or picking up the piano because I play both instruments. The songs tend to come out different, a little different. If I play guitar, sometimes they're a little bit more up and a little bit more heavier. And then the piano tends to be a little bit more middle of the road or more ballad -y. So. But it's just, I just sit down and just kind of doodle around and then, you know, you come up with a little melody or something and then I, I'll, I'll come up with a line, you know, a couple of lyrics, whatever comes to mind and then start writing it out. And before you know it, you know, if you're lucky, you got a song in an hour and that's just how it happens. So it's not necessarily yeah. lyrics first, music first, it all no, sort of just comes no, together. No, very rarely have I ever written, uh, written, uh, the had a bunch of lyrics written down and words or, or uh, and then put music to it. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. It comes at the yeah. same time. That's cool. And, and again, it's fascinating because, you know, so many different musicians and songwriters I've spoken to and there's a, it's a different method for everyone. And, you know, yeah. there are yeah. those that can also do it assigned. They sit down from nine to five on Tuesday through Thursday, and that is their writing time. Yeah, and I just I could never imagine being able to do that. Um, yeah, but it's cool to hear for you that it, it's it all comes together at once. You usually hear that it's one or the other uh, that'll yeah. get first. So that's that's kind of cool. Um, 
you know, we're, we're talking about Paul is all, which is the, the current record that's coming out of McCartney and Beatle covers. Um, and I know that you, you've never had the pleasure of working with Paul. You've done, as you said, you've done uh, Paul in, you know, and, and at, music at Epcot. At yeah, Epcot. At Epcot. Yeah, I did it for years. But you did actually get to meet the man at one point. Yeah. How did that yeah, that, was, that was like, whoa. <laughs> really? <laughs> I thought you were an album cover, man. Well, I was like John Lennon said when he met Chuck Berry, it talks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it actually speaks, and it's a real person there standing there that would have, you know. <laughs> no, it was it was a bizarre thing, and, and you know, uh, I I know that I remember in one of John Lennon's last interviews, he said, and I gotta bring this up before I tell you the story about meeting Paul. You see, he said, "Never aspire to meet your your heroes," and I know what he means because he because his whole point was you're gonna be let down or you're gonna be disappointed, you know. Uh, I can say how that could happen. I've met a lot of famous people in my travels, and um, but this one well, was not a disappointment. Uh, he was gracious, humble guy. Um, he was more interested in knowing what I was doing than uh, you know than he, what he was doing with George Martin at the time. Um, the way it worked was I was working. It was the last session I was doing at Abbey Road. Uh, that was 26 years ago. It was July 20th, 1995. And I booked the studio um, weeks in advance. I went over for two weeks actually to, to promote um, uh, uh, some other stuff I was doing over there um, and do some radio things. And uh, I, I met him in the, in the bar, the restaurant bar at Abbey Road where all the artists are and where the people work. You know? And it was in the afternoon and I didn't, I didn't even know he was there. And I didn't know uh, he was there with George Martin working on the Beatles anthology. That's what he was doing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because the anthology, if you remember, came out in November of 95. Yeah. But it was on the five-part series on uh, ABC, whatever it was, national television over in the yeah. U.S. Yeah. And then later on, of course, it came out on the D on video and DVD. But um, he, I, I was sitting at the, at the bar having a Guinness as you do when you go to Abbey Road. Of course. They have great, great Guinness there and great bitters. <laughs> and so I'm sitting there, it's like two in the afternoon, and I, I, I had dropped, just dropped off the tapes. I had only been in, uh, in, in England for a couple of days. And I had the, the, the uh, 16 track masters for the song I was working on uh, in my hotel room. I was like, you know, I don't know if anybody's going to try to steal them, but if I did lose them, I'd be in trouble. I wouldn't have no sessions. So I brought them to put them in the tape library at Abbey Road. Sure. And I knew everybody there for years because I've been working there since 85. So uh, I went and dropped the tapes off and then I went into the bar and I saw a couple of people, uh, this engineer that I knew from the last time I was there two years before and who's we sitting there and he was on break, you know, from his job and he was talking and I'm having a drink. And um, so... We were talking about the session coming up, which was the following week. And then all of a sudden, I, to the right, I saw George Martin walking in, grabbed a, a tray to get some food for lunchtime. You know? sure. I said, wow, amazing. George Martin, George Martin man. <laughs> and I had his book, The Making of Sergeant Pepper. You remember that came out in 87? Sure. Uh, 87. So I had gotten that book to read on a plane over and I had it in a little, like a little briefcase I had next to me. And I said, wow, this is great. You know, if we get introduced, I'll get signed the book, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. So as you do. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Not too much to ask. Got your book. Would you sign it? Yeah. Sir George. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so, but then he walked by and then um, I, I watched him as he walked past and he went down about 10 feet away at the table and Paul was sitting down with him with Paul's assistant, uh, John Hamill. Hmm. He's been with him for like 35, 40 years. Yeah, sure. And so the three of them sat down, uh, George Mark sat down and John Hamill, and then Paul sat and he was sitting at the table facing me. So, I mean, the look on my face must have looked like, <laughs> you know, it was insane, you know? <laughs> and so I, I, I looked, he looked and he, he sat down and he had his little veggie meal. He was at, he had a little vegetarian that I could see it was no meat on the plate. Sat down, looked like a salad or something. Sat down and he looked at me and I looked at him and I looked back at my friend and I turned back around and I said, let me ask you something. Do you have 911 over here? 
You know, you know when you dial 911? He says, you mean the emergency thing, right? I said, yeah. I said, well, you better call. He said, why? I said, I said, because I'm going to have a heart attack. <laughs> and he said, why? And he saw me, he saw me giggling. Well, I said, he says, oh, yeah, he's been here all week. He should have been here last week because George Ringo was here. Oh. I said, you could have met all three of them, he said. Oh, good I was Lord. like, oh. oh, my God. Are you kidding? Talk about pressure. You're not I mean, kidding. <laughs> yeah, so, and they were all there because they were checking out, you know, they were all yeah. working with George Martin on yeah. reviewing the work in progress on the anthology mixes. Yeah, sure, sure. So that day, it was just fall, right? So... So he said, listen, man, he said, I got I to gotta go do something. He says, watch my beer. You know, <laughs> they can drink over at every room when they work. It's very loose. It's not like being in America. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's much, you know, oh, yeah. they drink, they, drink they, they just have a little something, you know, it's just part of their culture. Mm -hmm. And so he went away and then I'm sitting there and I'm going, wow, this, he's right over there, you know. But look, Tony, you know, we, we're in the business, right? Yeah. Here I am. Yeah. I'm there recording, you know, my own, you know, as a as an artist on my on my own, and I know that this man signs autographs, you know, coming in to the office, going to the studio, whatever, and I was not going to go bother him. The man's eating. Sure. I showed that respect to him, and I I said, well, I can't go over there. I'm not going to do it. And I'm thinking, hmm, well, I sure would like to meet this guy. I mean, he's right there. It's never good. This is never going to happen again. And I've been watching him since '64. So I thought about it for a second and I said, well, I got a little notebook here, a little tie, I had a little notebook about this big. And I took a pen and I, I put it to a white page and I took the pen and I laid it and I put it on my lap like this, sat it on my lap. And then the guy was just, I was still by myself drinking a Guinness. And so I, once in a while, I would just kind of turn around on a chair, just kind of slightly. And then I kind of look around the room and look over at him and I had to lay it on my, on my lap. And, uh, <laughs> Now he sees me and he's looking at me. People said, do you think he recognized you kind of look like him? And I said, now the look on his face told me he knew something was up because he was looking at me. And he's eating, he's looking at me. His eyes are going back and forth. And I'm going, wow. Scoping you out. Is, yeah, he's checking me out. He's going, this guy's either going to come over to me. You know, he's been doing this all his life. He knows when it's a fan or something. Of course. You know, something's going on, you know. Yeah, of course. So it was amazing. I, I, I finally about 20, 10 minutes went by and he was i said they're gonna leave pretty soon so i looked at him and he looked at me and when i had, he was really looking at me i took the thing and i, and I kind of just held it up a little bit, like just slightly just went like this it kind of gave a little sheepish <laughs> what do you think and he looks at me and he goes Andy? he looks at me and goes there you go with that pole look yeah there you like, go. Okay. So now, <laughs> all right. He saw, you know, I was just the... didn't go over. Oh. So I got up and I turned around. And when I turned around, he had gotten up and walked over to me. He was walking over to me as I was turning around. I didn't, he didn't even wait for me to go over to the table. Like I say, he was about 10 feet away. All of a sudden, there he was. He was standing there with his hands in his pockets looking at me. And I'm standing there with the, the little paper thing. And I go, Hey, Paul, I'm John. <laughs> he goes, shook my hand. He goes, hey, John. He says, are you working here? I said, yeah. yeah I said, I, I got a session coming up, you know, next week. He goes, uh, checking the place out, eh? I said, no, well, I've been here before. I said, I, I did an album here uh, called Matthew Street. You know, uh, and, and he said, Matthew Street, that sounds familiar, like that. <laughs> so then he signed a little, he signed his, a little autograph for me. And then from that point, he said, uh, he said, good luck in your recording, man. Good luck in your recording. And he patted me on the shoulder, shook my hand again, and off he went. Off he went. Yeah, it, was, it was about a minute, you know. But it was, it was weird because he, when he, was, he, he was signing the thing, you know, he signed his, his autograph. I, I kind of, I looked down at him, you know, and I looked, he had sandals on. I said, it's weird. I said, those are the famous feet. I'm thinking to myself, that's the famous feet that walk across Abbey Road. <laughs> you know, it was it was the perspective. You know, it was ridiculous. Yeah, but it was surreal. You yeah, know, seeing, you know, seeing that cover since I was ten. You know, yep. And, yep. and then and then and I noticed he he looked younger than than he was at the time. He was fifty three. Yeah, 
He's yeah. 52 years yeah. old. And uh, was, he looked well, he looked like he was, you know, in his mid-40s. He looked like 10 years younger. He was really, looked really good, healthy. And he was very pink. He had pink, very vague English pink. You know? <laughs> and it was cool. And then, and then he went off. And then I sat down and said, what happened? How did this, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it was just sort of like, I, okay, I'm going to wake up. And it, that's gonna yeah, it was really thing. amazing. And then, and then of course, I couldn't wait to go. tell my brother Rye, you know, because you know, of course, of course, because we didn't meet him in '85 and '86. We almost met him. We missed him by one day in '86. Uh, oh wow! Yeah, he was working. He was in Studio Two doing that video for Press. Yeah, yeah, a single Press. Yeah, but we came in. We came in actually that morning into Gatwick in '86, and he was there that night or that day. And that evening doing that video and we didn't we we didn't go into the following day because we had jet lag you know and so and i said to my brother i said right i said why don't we just go drop the tapes off oh you know now oh and he said oh man i'm tired you know i i blame this on him it's my fault too and i said now he said we'll just, we gotta go we'll go in tomorrow tomorrow morning i said all right okay had we gone in there that would have been would have met him probably yeah you know, sure Oh, oh, the other thing I want to tell you about it about uh, meet McCartney. He met him actually prior to I did. He met him in uh, him and Linda in '91. Oh wow! It, at, at Carnegie Hall when they did the uh, oratorium. Okay. And his wife Anne was a, they were at a cocktail party and uh, I got a picture with him, signed an autograph. It's a beautiful picture I've got of my brother. With, That's with nice. And Anne, his wife, talked to Linda for about thirty minutes about photography and vegetarians and all of that. She, so it was really cool. So then I got to meet him four years they're, later. They're both very approachable, but everything I've heard is that, is that she was just a, a really delightful, really pleasant person. Yeah, that's what she and said. Same that, thing. that she was very, you know, yeah. she was so down to earth. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, just like the chat. She's a, New York, she's a New Yorker, you know. I mean, yeah, <laughs> she's just the real deal. deal. Yeah, just like he's a Liverpoolian, man. Those people, yep. it's, it's it, people, they're people, people, not to be cliche, but people. Yeah. People. That's true. That's true. Um, well, we are. I'm very, very glad that you're going to be joining us again as of this taping, which is June second of 2021. I'm very happy you're going to be with us on the 16th and uh, playing music yeah. from this 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 most recent release, the Paul is All tribute. And uh, again, people are going to really enjoy it. And uh, you know, you could see when you 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 all saw that when when you're going into the little bits. Of, you know, you 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 got you got the essence of what Paul's all about. You've been doing this a long time. I've been watching him for '64. I have to. I, 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 I must have learned something by now. Absolutely, Tony. I'm a very visual person. <laughs> I, it's all about visuals. It's all very, and you you you've got it. So um, again, and and also too, as I say, the the nice thing about this is that you've. Um, you've created a very, very nice souvenir of the event that you're going to be doing. And whether yeah. people get to see you live or not, uh, if you're yeah. a McCartney fan, Beatle fan, it's a really fun record. Uh, and if you just, and you've heard some of the little bits from the original music, but uh, check out Welcome to My World. And, uh, you know, I'll be, uh, you know, you'll hear some, some more stuff from, from John Babcock on, on uh, 4F Free Format for Free on my radio show. And uh, hopefully, I don't know how often you make it up to New York, but you know, yeah. we'll, whenever you're up, we're, you'll always have a, a, a room to play in. So, Oh, that's great, man. You know, it's just, uh, I'm so excited about doing it. My wife and I are coming up to see my family and we get to, uh, to see old friends and uh, you really looking forward to doing uh, the show for the library and all that. Yeah. All right. So before we go, one thing, I know that uh, you happen to have an instrument close by. And uh, it's always a guitar some, somewhere around in the room. So always. before we say farewell for our friends on uh, on the radio and on uh, there we are at the, at the Port Washington Library YouTube page, and uh, you're you're a righty, but that's totally acceptable. And we'll... <laughs> I, I used to tell people, you know, it's funny because it's not you know, once in a while it would happen at um, at Epcot, you know, they'd say, "You look like him, you sound just like him. How come you don't play left handed?" I say. Well, the truth of the matter is, is the mirror broke. Oh, very good. Very good. <laughs> and I said, if you come back tomorrow, bring a mirror. We'll have it, right, we'll have it working again. And you can... <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Well, I so, will uh, let you take it away. And, and your John's, John's choice, man. <laughs> all right, let's see what we got here. 
Absolutely brilliant. That was great fun. Um, and an indicator of what people are going to get to see. Um, so the cool thing about that is um, not only will folks get to see, are we doing that song in the set before I tease that? <laughs> it probably will be. There we go. All and right. I'll do, and I'll do, I'll do the other version in the, in the bridge again. Cool. Okay. Full so, version. so we'll get the full length version at the, yeah. uh, at the gig at the Port Library. And whether you can or can't make the gig at the library, uh, John, you are one of the nice things about us. What's bringing you into town is a homecoming of sorts. And you are going to be performing at the Turning Point, which is just a, a wonderful venue uh, yeah. in Piermont, New York. And uh, when is that happening? So everybody knows. That would be uh, on June 18th, cool. Friday, June 18th, Friday. appropriately enough. Yeah. And, and what's, what's, so what's about, what about that day? What's that going to have to do with anything? Oh, I don't know. We'll have to just find out when I get there. <laughs> Those of you who are in the know know exactly where That's we're going right. with that. Yeah. It's, and it's not, a secret. It's a secret. You're <laughs> going to have secret. to you're gonna have to Google it. So uh, June yeah. 18th, and Paul is all a tribute uh, at the uh, Turning Point in Piermont. And of course, yeah. we'll be at the library on uh, June 16th. And you know, I'm bringing my band in the box, you know. The band in a box. And yeah, band in a box because, yeah, I couldn't get, I couldn't get them to... Uh, to fly up with me, oh. uh, the trio or the quartet, but it's going to be me doing Paul's all with my band in the box. And the band in the box is yours truly playing the instruments. Cool. So it, it truly is a one man yeah. Paul McCartney tribute. So one man. That's man. Good. Yeah. So it's not just acoustic guitar. You're going to, you're going to rock out. We're going to rock out. We're going to have a great time. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So, all right. So, uh, Again, thanks so much for doing this. And uh, we are doing a uh, Inside the Musician's Mind for the Port Washington Public Library. And uh, thank you, John, for, uh, for taking oh, part yes. in this. And, my uh, pleasure, man. And again, look for um, Welcome to My World. Look for Paul is All. And uh, I want to thank you all for tuning in. And uh, hopefully another episode to come soon. John Babcock, my guest. I'm Tony Trugardo for the Port Washington Public Library. Hope to see you all soon.